You're gonna be dead in two days. Yeah. Have I you, am. Have you processed that? I mean, as much as did that arrest you, Colin? Uh, December twenty second, nineteen seventy eight, is when I was arrested. To my understanding, there was a total of twenty nine bodies or twenty eight bodies. Mm -hmm. I feel bad about killing the first person I killed in Vietnam. I see them just as vividly, just as clear. One was under the garage, so that, that makes a total of 29. Okay. Uh, December 22nd, 1978 is when I was arrested. Number three, Billy Wayne Coble. Billy Wayne Coble was a Vietnam veteran and an electrician who had fallen head over heels in love with Karen Vicka when they got married in the summer of 1988. He had high hopes for his third marriage, but things took a dark turn when he started having marital problems and separated from his wife not long before the tragic events that would change his life forever. Do you regret what you did that day? Do you understand and feel the horror? I accept that I did the murders, yes. I accepted that I'm here for those murders. Do you feel bad about what you did? Well. I feel bad about the murder of Bobby and his parents. Yes, I feel bad that uh, feel bad about killing the first person I killed in Vietnam. I see them just as vividly, just as clear. In the days leading up to the incident, Coble had kidnapped Karen at knife point, desperately trying to convince her not to divorce him. After releasing her unharmed, he was seen driving around the area where Karen and her family lived consumed by a thirst for power and control. On that fateful day, he couldn't find Karen, but he did find her mother, father, and brother. Reports filed after his arrest detailed how he shot them in their own home. In a desperate attempt to escape, he kidnapped Karen at gunpoint and handcuffed her three children and their cousin to a bed. Death. Who is not going to leave this world? Aren't we all? Did you love your wife, Karen? We all have emotions, mm. and there's many different as I did the day that it happened, but I can never go back and change that. Police pursued him as he fled in a car with Karen, ultimately arresting him with his car crashed. Karen had survived, but not without sustaining knife wounds from where Coble had attacked her. In the hospital, Coble is believed to have confessed to taking the lives of three people. Since his arrest in 1990, Coble had been on Slay Row, fighting his inevitable fate. In 2007, his sentence was overturned and he was awarded a new trial. However, in 2008, he was again sentenced to the gallows. For almost 30 years, Coble awaited his final judgment. Finally, on February 28th, his fate was sealed. He became the oldest inmate executed by Texas since the state resumed carrying out capital punishment in 1982. His actions had shattered the lives of many families and left behind a legacy of pain and suffering. But in the end, justice had been served and his victims' families could finally find some sense of closure. Number 2. Scott Dozier Scott Dozier was born on November 20th, 1970 in Boulder City, Nevada. As a young man, he had hopes and dreams of a happy and fulfilling life. But as he got older, he made some dark choices that would eventually lead to his downfall. In his mid-twenties, Dozier was making most of his income from the production and sale of methamphetamine, which led him to travel back and forth between Nevada and Arizona. But it was his connection to two brutal slayings that would make him infamous. In April 2002, Jeremiah Miller met Dozier at a motel on the Las Vegas Strip, hoping to buy ephedrine from him, a key ingredient in the production of methamphetamine. Dozier promised to help Miller and took his $12,000 in cash only to take Miller's life, dismember him, and stuff his remains into a suitcase, which he then disposed of near an apartment complex in Las Vegas. You're going to be dead in two days. Yeah. You, I am. Have you processed that? I mean, as much as I'm thrashing, coughing. So actually, I was going to bring that up with my mother and say, listen, just so you know, I've talked to people. I don't get it at all. Why do you think the country has turned to lethal injection as opposed to the other methods? You know, if you're murdering somebody, man, it's going to be... Brutal. The suitcase was found the following week and Dozier was arrested in Phoenix, Arizona in June 2002. During the police investigation, Dozier's involvement in another slaying, that of Jason Griffin Green, was revealed. Green's remains were discovered in the desert north of Phoenix and it was alleged that Dozier had shot him at a trailer in Carefree, Arizona, because Green threatened to expose Dozier's methamphetamine operation. 
Doug Powell, a former drug associate of Dozier's, confessed that he had helped Dozier dispose of Green's remains. Back for that to happen? I do. And you're cool with that? I don't care. I'm not gonna get up off that fucking table. How do you feel about the state using fentanyl to kill you? I think it's awesome. The death penalty? No, I don't, though, actually. However, I think that... You know, about it, because, uh... I think if there's a wrong that needs killing, you know, I mean, if that's the answer to it, somebody killed somebody I love, and I was sure they did it. I mean, like, someone raped your sister, the only thing you do is bail that person out of jail. Although Dozier argued that he had not taken Green's life, he was sentenced to 22 years in prison in 2005. In 2007, Dozier was extradited to Nevada, where he was tried and convicted of Miller's slaying. He received the capital punishment on October 3, 2007, which was upheld by the Nevada Supreme Court on January 23, 2012. However, his ending was delayed for several years due to litigation by pharmaceutical companies against the use of their drugs in slayings. Throughout his time on Slay Road, Dozier's mental state had deteriorated. He had been on self-hurt watch for months, and his lawyers claimed that he had been deprived of personal belongings and outside contact. On January 5, 2019, prison officials found him lifeless in a cell, having hanged himself from a bedsheet attached to an air vent. He had passed away at the age of 48. His actions had shattered families and left behind a legacy of pain and suffering. Although he had asked the state authorities to act on their slaying codes, in the end, he had taken his own life, leaving many unanswered questions and unresolved issues in the wake. Number 1. John Wayne Gacy On a fateful day, March 17, 1942, the world welcomed John Wayne Gacy into its midst, unaware of the darkness he would bring. Born the second child in a family of four, he forged close bonds with his mother and sisters, though his father's heavy hand cast a shadow over his childhood. A troubled man and an alcoholic, his father's violent tendencies inflicted suffering on young Gacy and his family. One vivid memory etched into Gacy's psyche was the day his father mercilessly beat him with a leather belt for accidentally disarranging a car engine. His mother valiantly attempted to shield her son from her father's wrath, but her efforts were futile. Despite the attacks, Gacy held a deep if not desperate love for his father, yearning to prove himself worthy in his eyes. By 1949, Gacy's reality had become a battleground where he was both the victim and the perpetrator of violence. He faced health issues growing up, but his father showed no compassion or empathy, only intensifying Gacy's inner turmoil. Way in the back of the house, in the rec room, on the telephone. When they walked, finally walked, walked around the side of the house, police station. Okay, well, I didn't have time because I was doing work for the county and, and stuff like that. I started doing painting, and then I started doing wallpapering and decorating. And inside of three years, 1974 became a corporation. And then I owned PDM Contractors Corporation. I owned statement of the police department. And from that date forward, mm -hmm. uh, they were had me under. With perseverance and determination, Gacy eventually found stability and love in his life, wedding Marilyn Myers in September 1964 after a six-month courtship. Gacy's father-in-law purchased three Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants in Waterloo, Iowa, providing the newlyweds with a livelihood. They moved into a new home where Gacy opened a club in the basement, a place where employees could drink and play pool. Unbeknownst to them, the space would become a breeding ground for Gacy's malevolent acts. In February 1966, Gacy's wife gave birth to their son, followed by a daughter in March 1967. Gacy reveled in this period of his life, finally earning his father's elusive approval. During a family visit in July 1966, his father apologized for years of torment and proudly acknowledged his son's achievements. But it was too late. Gacy's soul had already been tainted, and his path to redemption was lost. Emboldened by his newfound confidence, Gacy's dark impulses began to emerge, and he preyed upon young teenage boys. Soon the law caught up with him, and he was arrested and interrogated. He resorted to criminal tactics to silence witnesses, but his efforts were in vain. A psychological evaluation revealed him to be a sociopath with psychotic tendencies and no hope for rehabilitation. Gacy was sentenced to 10 years in prison for attacking teenager Voris. His wife filed for divorce, took their property, and gained sole custody of their children. Gacy would never see his family again. Thus began his descent into a life of crime a sinister journey that would ultimately lead to the darkness within. 
In 1970, Gacy was released from prison after serving just 18 months of his sentence. In 1971, he was back behind bars, accused of attacking another teenage boy. His mother provided financial support, allowing Gacy to purchase a ranch house near the village of Nordridge, which would become his hunting ground. He hosted lavish parties, rubbing shoulders with the wealthy and influential, even remarrying, although it was merely a ruse to keep suspicion at bay. His second wife would later recall the frequent comings and goings of young boys and the discovery of their belongings. By 1979, Gacy had built a thriving career in interior design, remodeling, installation, assembly, and landscaping. Through his membership in a local moose club, he joined the Jolly Joker Clown Club, creating the personas of Pogo the Clown and Patches the Clown. These alter egos accompanied Gacy on a gruesome crime spree, the likes of which the world had never seen before. Uh, and that same day, they held me there at, for nine hours, and while holding me there for nine hours, they surveillance. The only trouble is, is that the, the Mickey Mouse the way they were doing it, they had two cars following me day and night. To my understanding, there was a total of 29 bodies, or 28 bodies, mm -hmm. where finally one was under the garage. So that, that makes a total of 29. Okay. Now, uh, uh, from the standpoint of the arrest, when you did that arrest, do you recall? Uh, December 22nd, 1978 is when I was arrested. As he spiraled further into darkness, Gacy managed to evade capture. In part because his victims were young men, his insatiable impulses drove him to act on his twisted fantasies, heedless of the consequences. By the time his reign of terror was brought to a halt, 33 lives had been snuffed out. Gacy's trial began on February 6, 1980, where he faced charges for 33 slayings. His lawyers entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, painting Gacy as a Jekyll and Hyde figure. They bought forth psychiatric experts who had examined him, but the mounting evidence and testimonies against him could not be denied. Convicted for 33 slayings, Gacy's infamy surpassed that of all other individuals in U.S. history at the time. His descent into darkness had finally come to an end, but the shadow of his gruesome acts would forever haunt the memories of those who crossed his path. That's all for this video, folks. See you next time.